Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Thomas Kennedy says, I write about corruption and corporate greed. He is a journalist, organizer, writer, and an immigrant. Thomas graduated with an international relations major from Florida International University and a master's in community and social change from the University of Miami. Thomas has worked for nonprofits and civil rights organizations, including Service Employees International Union, the New Florida Majority, and as the political director for the Florida Immigration Coalition, managing statewide electoral campaigns and voter registration efforts. Recently, he worked for Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign, where he helped manage a team of volunteers across 50 states and worked at United We Dream as national campaign manager. He currently advises progressive and immigrant rights organizations and serves as a Democratic National Committee member who is focused on reforming the institution to make it more democratic and focused on working class issues. Thomas is one of our people. He is changing the narrative, and we are so pleased to welcome him today. Hi, Thomas. Hey. It's so nice to meet you sort of in person. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for being so easy about coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No, no, thank you for the invitation. And yes, I was slightly late. So no worries, please. Work. Absolutely no worries. Well, I'm incredibly happy that you're here to share the space with me. And I think I'd like to start with some of your backstory just to fill in some gaps because I'm sure people who follow you know what you do now, but they don't necessarily know. You know, you know the the uh the immediacy of social media. People don't necessarily look back to see actually who the person is, they just gravitate towards what the person says. So mm-hmm. I, I just want to give them a little bit of your backstory and have you share it with us. So you were raised in Argentina until nine years old. Mm-hmm. Will you share what you remember about that journey to the US and how your parents explained this to you? Yeah, so I mean it's complicated. I think there was a lot of different factors that precipitated us coming to the United States. Okay. But um, you know, my parents were working class people. My mom like never finished high school actually. She had like a, a working class job working uh as the front desk person for this at a university. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, checking people in and out, whatever. Uh and my dad worked for uh, a print uh, like uh basically like the print shop for yeah. the Argentinian Congress. Okay, got so it. He basically like edited uh, was part of the team that edited like documents. Like mm-hmm. like when a bill passed, right? It's like printed, they edited yeah. the documents. So you know, uh my dad struggled with like drug problems throughout okay. most of my um childhood. Mm, sorry. You know, he was it's okay. Uh, he cleaned up, so that's that's good oh, for that's him, good for my family. <laughs> uh, but he was like, you know, in and out of my life, kind of, you know, throughout my childhood, and he struggled a lot, you know, economically, emotionally, physically, whatever, you know, in all ways that people with with drug addiction, addictions in general, do. But in two thousand one, uh, actually, no, in the year two thousand, there was an economic implosion in right. Argentina mm-hmm. uh, due to us defaulting on, you know, IMF induced debt. Right. Uh, it it was precipitated by a a you know currency scam mm-hmm. that was imposed by the neoliberal government in the '90s of President Carlos Menem that they basically dollarized the economy. Okay. And they va- they artificially valued the peso, which is our currency, at, at, as the same as the dollar. So oh, one wow. dollar was worth one dollar, and obviously that's like that was not true it was fantasy and it was done through heavy amounts of borrowing and other like economic gymnastics Mm -hmm. that eventually resulted in a massive implosion of the argentinian economy and a default of our debt and collapse of our currency in the year 2000 uh, that eventually ended with something called el corralito which was uh a freeze on i believe savings accounts only uh, of if i remember correctly of savings accounts of argentinians so imagine that 
Oh my God. Like the United States economy implodes tomorrow. And then the government is like, you cannot remove the money out of your savings account because there was a run on banks, right? Like people are, oh my God. Yeah. So it was a disaster. Uh, but my dad, uh, my mom didn't get this, but my dad, because he was a government employee, they were laying off government employees in mass, right? Or, or attempting them to leave their jobs because they didn't have currency to like mm -hmm. basically pay off people on government payroll. Right. So they offered my dad severance because he had been working there for a long time. They offered him severance to leave his job uh, voluntarily. And my dad took the severance because, you know, he was like, they're going to lay us off at some point. So I'm just going to take it now. And because um, he also wanted to, he wanted to take the money and move to the United States. Okay. To basically try to clean up here, you know, away from, that's like something that, you know, like they tell people with struggle with addiction, like remove yourself from right. bad environment. Right. So he took the money and he decided to move here. And then him and my mom that were separated at the time, I don't know, they decided to patch things up and <laughs> take the, the immigrant, I guess, journey together. Mm -hmm. And they brought me along. And yeah, that's how we ended up in the United States in the year 2001. So now, obviously, you were too young to really understand all the nuances. But what was kind of the rough shot of what they what they said? Like, we're, you know, we're just go we're going. Um, or did they explain anything to you? Because that's a lot. I, I vaguely remember this happening and I can't imagine being in it and trying to explain it to your child while you're trying to figure it out, you know? You know, I feel like my parents were pretty open and transparent with me. Okay. Uh, and I feel like I had a pretty good sense of what was happening. You know, I mean, from what I remember, you know, I mean, obviously I knew that my dad struggled with drug addiction. Okay. I knew that my parents were separated. Um, but I think, I, I don't remember exactly. I mean, there okay. was so much that happened and I'm 31 now, but I'm sure you know, I, I remember them just them telling me, you know, like we're, we're yeah. going to go and we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to the United States because things are too rough here, you know? Yeah. And that, you know, I think what you're pointing out is the simplicity of that terminology, right? They don't have to go into what happened with the currency. They didn't have to explain all the details, but to make it age appropriate and not to lie, sounds like it benefited you greatly. I think so, you know, and I and I remember, you know, like, uh, yeah, I remember my my dad actually when I was very young. I think maybe like seven or something. He like sat me down and he like they told me he's like, you know, uh, I have a drug. I know I have a drug problem, and he explained to me what addiction was, and you know, it, it was like a heavy conversation. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if it was age appropriate, but I I kind of like appreciated like back. I have a memory of it, and yeah. I think. It was the right thing to do uh, at the time uh, because it helped me understand more of my dad's situation, you know. So I, I just think they were very open and transparent with me. Um, and yeah, and I, I, I think I had like a full grab or as much as a child can have right. in terms of asking the situation. Mm -hmm. I remember just, you know, having it. You know, in the in the world of of decolonization, which we're all placing great emphasis on, I think it's really important to note that what's age appropriate may seem what's which age inappropriate may be culturally appropriate. And mm -hmm. so I think we have to start to wrap ourselves around that we're not necessarily looking at it through a Eurocentric lens of what is appropriate and not appropriate because cultures vary and what what works for them. And it sounds like, you know, you and your family figured it out, which is amazing. So yeah. And it, and it could vary at the individual level too, right? Like however your relationship is with your child or your loved ones or your family. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you might just feel the need to yeah. share. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it can be so different. I, I agree that it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's all about the individual. I just think as coming from collective cultures, mm -hmm. there, is, there, is, there is a map, you know, for, for sure. some things, even if it's not conscious, conscious it's, it's in there. But, you know, I also think it's pretty incredible that you you said in your bio that you lived undocumented uh, as an undocumented person for over a decade, yeah. you know, and did, did you ever see uh, Living Undocumented 2019 uh, Netflix documentary? No, no, I haven't seen it. It was unbelievable. And um, it just it left such an impression on me. And I'm, I'm wondering what was the most challenging part of your experience growing up? Yeah. So that's another thing I think uh, 
that my parents are really transparent about the undocumented experience. So, okay. so we came here in, in the year 2001, right before the 9-11 attacks, I think. Oh, okay. Like we might have gotten here around like February or March. So oh, not wow. right before, but like. Yeah, so, yeah. The year of. Yeah. And, you know, my dad I, 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 and mom, they like, so my, my, my dad's sister, my dad's sister lives in New Jersey okay. and she has like, she's always had papers. So he, I think he had this like fantasy that like, oh, I can just get to the United States and then like my sister's going to petition me and like, we'll figure it out. And, you know, what like as <laughs> many immigrants do. Sure. And then he got here and he realized that like, oh, wait, this is actually a lot more complicated than, you know, whatever I painted in my head. Right. I think the 9-11 attacks happened and that like severely restricted immigration laws. Yeah. That's where ICE came about, DHS, real, the Real ID Act, you know, restrictions on like driver, getting driver's licenses and state, the, you know, it, everything changed. Everything got more difficult and whatever my dad was intending to do just got blown up. Wow. So we, we, we came here with, with tourist visas, right? Like we... We, we didn't like uh, cross the border. So we were a, a little bit luckier in the sense that we came here with like that, like, you know, ramp of just like, we had like initial documents, you know, we were able to get like initial, like my dad was able to get a driver's license, but then immediately like the, your tourist visa ends after three months and we were left undocumented. Oh, and, you know, my, my dad was the only one that was able to secure a driver's license. But after that driver's license expired, he was left without a driver's license. Oh, wow. Uh, and in terms of growing up, what was the most difficult thing? So, you know, I, I, I work in immigration stuff now and I've had a lot of undocumented friends and, you know, a lot of parents don't tell their children that they're undocumented. I know it's a very, you know, and, and no aspersions, no judgment cast on that because it's a difficult Absolutely. situation to maneuver and everybody does their best. But, you know, you, you I've heard a lot of stories of just like kids that like graduate high school or like they go to like try to get their permit you know like late into high school and then they run into a roadblock and that's when their parents are like yeah look actually <laughs> we don't have papers you can't do all that wow. so and obviously you can imagine that's quite a shock for so my parents no my parents were always from day one from very early on they told me like we don't have papers it's going to be different there's a lot of like you know blocks and obstacles that we're going to have so I had like I, I appreciated that because I, I I like tr like I had that like you know expectation I guess of mm -hmm. my life, but I will say that after when I, when I became the the first time that I remember truly feeling like damn this is gonna be a problem was in sophomore year. In sophomore year high school is when people usually get their permits their, right. their driving permit and they do so at least at the time, I don't know now, but they do so in Miami Dade Public Schools, you can take an elective, which is like driver's ed. And at the end of driver's ed, they give you your permit. And, you know, you can drive, whatever. Um, and I remember that, like, I did not take driver's ed. I took an art class because I, I was I was like, I did not share with anyone that I was undocumented. Understood. Like the Bush years. People were more scared back then. I was also like embarrassed by it. So I remember I took um, I, an art class and my friends were like, why don't you take driver's ed, dude? Like you can get your permit out of this super easy. You know, you're going to have to go take a test. And I was like, ah, eh, no, I'm not going to get a car anytime soon. And I, I really like, I did like art. I, like, I, I was in a magnet school for art or whatever, but I was like, I'm just going to take another art class. People were like, okay, weirdo. Yeah. But that was the first time that I'm like, hmm, you know, like I don't, I don't, I don't want to like come to like to terms with this right now. You know, I don't want to give explanations and this is something that I'm not going to be able to like work around. And then, you know, beyond that, it's like my friends started getting cars or driver's licenses or, or jobs, you know, that were like, and I don't want to say real job, but not, not under the table jobs, right? Mm -hmm. like getting mm -hmm. jobs and, do, and applying for uh, universities in college and those are things that i couldn't do right i, I worked construction for a long time because i had to get paid under the table i couldn't you know work at anywhere where they asked for a social security there was no in-state tuition for undocumented students in florida at the time so going to university is three to four times more expensive because you have to pay as a foreign student i couldn't obviously i mean getting a car was expensive to begin with but i couldn't get insurance 
couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't get a driver's license, you know, so all these things, I, I, I all of a sudden, the, the older I got, the more I saw like doors closing around me, you know, and like different barriers that I was like, I'm not going to be able to work around this obstacle. Like I'm stuck. You explain that so incredibly well. At some point I stopped breathing, you know, <laughs> because I felt the pressure that, yeah. you know, you, you had to navigate um, an adolescence, which is already a tumultuous time for a human being. And, and for you to, it sounds like having the awareness prepared you. And at the same time, there was so much grief for you to manage because you, your experience was different. Yeah. You know, and also like it, it created like a little bit of tension between me and my parents, because mm -hmm. obviously as I got older, I got more frustrated and I, you know, I got, I was like, you know, I would be like, why the hell did you guys come here with no plan? Like what the hell? And it's not their fault. You know I mean? They were like escaping a horrible economic situation and, you know, trying to give me a better life. And ultimately they did, but you know, it, it is, a, it is a horrible situation for both parents and a young person and just like the family nucleus to just a for the parents because the obstacles that they face on their day-to-day -day lives and their own goals but then you know having a child or like a young person that's like you know they, they have their whole life ahead of them or whatever and just from the get-go from from the from the starting line right all of a sudden you know you you, you can't you can't pick up speed you're you're, you're starting you know with like fucked up you know yeah yeah so it's, it's very very frustrating uh and you again you feel like you're gonna get stuck you're gonna get left behind and uh, you know that's like the most important not the most important but that's like an important time of your life for you to hustle and make moves right mm -hmm. and yeah it was very frustrating it was very scary too you know it was you like know, go ahead good finish that thought i just wanted to add something no, last thing, you know, you, we live in this like hyper capitalist competitive society, you know, where it's like you're pressured to want to, you know, make something of yourself. And there's also something inside of you that inherently you want to be a, you want to be productive, you want to contribute, whatever. There's you get pulled in all sorts of directions, but especially in this sort sort of society that emph emphasizes com competition mm -hmm. and making it so much from, you know, from the beginning, you're, you feel like you're not going to be able to it's insanely stressful. It's a constant reminder. You know, I can relate to that as an African-American. You know, we don't have the immigrant experience, so we don't have the same fantasy about America and what it's going to be like. But there mm -hmm. is this constant pressure of what you're not going to be able to do and trying to fight against that. And one of the things that you said so clearly that I think is a big part of the journey of, of immigration is the burden of shame and guilt. You know, I mean, the fact that your parents are, are, you know, holding this burden of did we make the right decision and and our child is struggling and, and you can't really articulate it developmentally enough to let them know, hey, I get what you did, but I hate what you did because it's really hard on me. There's no real real role modeling for that sort of exchange. So there's some adolescent angst that just can't be articulated clearly. And I'm sure they're just trying to let you know they're doing the best they can. In retrospect, it's a lot easier for you to see but you had a right to feel as frustrated as you did during that time. That's a, that's a lot to navigate. Yeah. I don't know if I had a right, but you know, it just, it's just what you feel and people are people, mm -hmm. um, you know, and even, I mean, I have a great relationship with my parents and I love them even back then, but now I look back on it and I almost feel like a sense of shame. I understand. Um, but, but, you know, but then again, you, you just feel so frustrated at the situation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um and and you know the because because you know like we came here in 2001 and i ended up getting my papers around 2000 like 13 2014 i think i remember very well but like 12 years later right um and you know i remember like we would say things like well you know like when i was in like middle school something like they're like Congress is going to do something, right? Like they're going to pass like, you know, immigration reform or amnesty or, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? Like they called it amnesty last time when Reagan did it in 1986. Yeah. Now they call it immigration reform, you know, path to citizenship, whatever. And be like, they're going to do something. And then like a couple of years later, well, they're going to do something. And then a couple of years later, well, it's something, you know? And yeah. even to this day, I mean, I came here in 2001. It is August 8th of 2022 there has not anything passed 
right. nothing, N not even a piecemeal for farm workers, for TPS recipients, for DACA recipients, nothing. So I, I you know, we can get into how I got my papers later, but if I would have been just like waiting, I, I, I would still be in limbo, you know, well, like many people are. You, so you that, that just goes to show you, like, I, I just say that because I was frustrated and a lot of people are frustrated because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. There's right. no light at the end of the tunnel for that situation. Right. Right. And so I, I want to emphasize that you're absolutely, uh, or I'm, it's not right or wrong, but I'm in agreement with you that it's not, you had the right. It's more like it's understandable, yeah. you know, because in order for you to be right, your parents would have to be wrong. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm, so thank you for clarifying that. It's more like the whole situation is overwhelming. How could you not be overwhelmed as a, as a human being and respond as such? And I, I think it's, it's, you know, look, there's so many things that's, that's, that, that are criminal in this society. And this is, this is yet another layer, which is why I was so excited to have you come on, because you have to have gone through the experience to be able, able to really articulate, you know, the nuances that get missed. And one of the things that you just depicted so clearly is the idea that you have to keep hope alive. Like this is, you know, just another, another administration, just maybe another administration, like it's coming, it's coming. And at some point you have to look at it and say, okay, what is it? You know, how do we manage this effectively? And there has to be a sense of hopelessness. And at the same time, you don't want it to be for naught, but I understand that inner conflict. That's, that's real, very, very real. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing actually I also want to add that I often think about uh, and I don't say this to virtue signal, but it's it's like a real thing that I've thought about a lot as I grew up is like the question of privilege, even in an unprivileged situation, because mm -hmm. I do think overall, like my my status was an unprivileged one in terms of I was blocked from accessing a lot of opportunities that were given to somebody else. But at the same time, my identity put me in a, a more privileged position within that context than others. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you an example. I remember, you know, in 12 or whatever many years that I was undocumented, you know, I got, I, there were a couple of times that I got, you know, stopped by the police. One mm -hmm. was like, uh, okay. One time I was, I used to be a, a cigarette smoker. Mm -hmm. I got stopped smoking a cigarette outside uh, of because I was underage. You can't really smoke cigarette. It wasn't marijuana or anything, which I have nothing against, but I was smoking a cigarette. I got stopped. You know, they pulled my information. Whatever. Another instance was my friend was driving. We got pulled over. My friend got pulled over and they asked for ID for everyone in the car, you know, for some because we were young. I don't know. They were, you know, the cops being cops. Yeah. And both times. I, I didn't have an, I, I never had, a, I had an ID growing up except for like my I school did. ID, right? Like my, my, my high mm -hmm. school ID, but I never had like, what's called a real, like a, a, it's a legal term, a real ID, a driver's license, a state ID, never had that. And I also never had a social security number. So I remember, especially the time that I, I, I'm telling you that we got pulled over in the car. I remember the cop asked for my ID. I didn't have my ID. I gave him my school ID. And then he asked me, okay, well, this is not a real ID. What's your social security number? And I was like, I don't remember it. Oh, wow. That was my go-to line. And, and of course, I didn't have one. It's not that I don't remember. I, I was like, and then he like went and he was like trying to look me up in the computer and he couldn't find me. I remember my ex-girlfriend was in the car and she knew I was undocumented. Um, and she started crying because she started getting like stressed out about it because like she got afraid. That started stressing me out, obviously. And then like the cop came and he, you know, you could tell that he like knew something was off. Mm -hmm. was like, I can't find you, blah, blah. And then he ended up giving me a warning. I hadn't, I hadn't even done anything wrong. I was a passenger. So right. he ended up giving me a warning, you know, and like, he's like, you got to have ID. You got to remember social security. And then whatever. He like, I think he gave like a citation to the driver and we, they let us go. But, you know, I, I, I always think about it. like if my name, you know, wasn't, Thomas Kennedy. I, I say Tomas because that's how we you know we, we yeah. say in Argentina. But if my name wasn't Thomas Kennedy, you know, a very like Anglo sounding name, very white name, you know, and I didn't look, you know, like white passing as I do. If my name, I don't know, was Cesar Gomez, you know, right. and I was a little bit darker skinned or whatever, like those interactions could go differently because it's statistically proven that they go differently, right? You know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think about that a lot.
Well, you know, I want I want to I want to sort of um, put that in another framework because I don't hear anything privileged about that experience at all. So I, I have a reaction to privilege because there was nothing privileged in your experience. It was oppressive, uh, you know, anxiety provoking and nerve wracking. Now, do you have different different access because? You can be white passing, sure. And your name can be white passing, absolutely. There are layers of oppression and there are layers of the abuse of oppression. So yeah, absolutely, I'm in agreement with that. But there was nothing privileged. Let me just make that clear. That was a horrific experience and I and I, I feel you on that. No, thank you. And, and that's why I say, right, that I think like the the, the overall context of my situation mm -hmm. was was not privileged. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, it's it's good to just for like even just for situational awareness. Yeah, sure. To like you know analyze like your your positioning because. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's yeah. that old. It's the saying that that parents used to say. It could always be worse. <laughs> <laughs> Some somehow that's supposed to make you feel better. It could always be worse, right? Yeah. So I understand in your body, it's helpful for you to have that awareness. It also does give you situational awareness and, and a better perspective. I always get nervous about white people grab it, grasping on to people who are oppressed, having any kind of privilege because it becomes a hook, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so I like to, you know, nip that in the bud because it's, it's not privilege. You don't walk through the world unnoticed and um, based on skin color, because as soon as you speak, people are going to make assumptions. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so it is different, but I know what you're saying and I appreciate that outcome. You know, it's already clear to me we're not going to get through this in one show. So Thomas, let's let's end the interview right here for now because I definitely want to have you come back and and finish part 2 of this cuz I have so many more questions for you. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, sounds good.